your mind's job is to do what it thinks you want. When you go, I want a week off. Who's ever done this? What I would give for a week off lying in bed. Your mind goes, leave that with me. Now you got the flu. How cool am I? I listened to you. You wanted a week off lying around watching Netflix. Now you got it. So I've been a therapist for 33 years and I really do understand language patterns. But I also have a great belief that you cannot fix what you don't understand. You certainly can't heal what you don't feel. So what I'm going to do with you today is I'm going to take you first through the rules of the mind. They're my rules of the mind. I, I made them up. But I made them up over 33 years. And somebody said to me once, well, who are you to make this up? I went, well, someone's got to do it. I think 33 years of working with royalty and Olympic athletes gives me the right to say, these are the rules of the mind. And if ever you're stuck with a client, stuck with a child, stuck with an adult that needs some help, and you think, oh, I don't know what to do take them through the rules of the mind, because it actually blows their mind. They go, well, I never knew that. I didn't understand that. And we will come after the rules of the mind to language patterns. Now, I've given you some slides on language patterns that are really for young children, but they also are very effective for adults. So let's do a quick little language thing right now. I want you to close your eyes, and I want you to go, I'm going to try to remember these rules of the mind. I'm going to try so hard to memorize it. If only I could memorize that document. I wish I had a better memory. I hope I can remember that when I'm working with my own client. I really hope I can do what she does. I wish I could do it. I hope to do it. I'm going to try to do it. I really want to do it. And just focus on how you feel when you use the word wish, which is wishy-washy. I don't like wish. Wishing says to your mind, you haven't got a prayer, but you might as well wish. Because wishing just says, you're not going to do that. Oh, I wish. No one says, I wish I could get up in the morning and clean my teeth. I wish I could pick up that pencil and write a note. You don't say wish. You go, oh, I'm doing it. So when you say to the mind, I wish I could, it says, yeah, me too. Get over it. When you say to the mind, I hope, I hope I get this right, it goes, yeah, well, keep hoping, because you're not going to do that. When you go, if only, your mind goes, well, you never managed it before, so keep on with the if only, why don't you? But when you do it differently, close your eyes again and go, I will memorize this. It's going in. I have a phenomenal memory. My memory is awesome. I read things and they empower me and they stick. I am remembering it all. I do this. I've got it. I have a phenomenal memory. I have incredible powers of recall and assimilation. And I remember everything. It has a totally different effect. And so you learn with language. I never let my clients say wish. I won't allow them to say the word but. I could do that, but no, we never say but. And we also never say should. My therapist said to me, excuse me, swearing, should is shit, and never use that word. I should. I say I could. I should go to the gym. I could go to the gym, but I know it's my fault. I'm not making the effort. So with young children, just changing one word will change their life. I'll give you an example. My little girl would go to school, and she'd get to the gate, and she'd come back. And I'd always say, what have you remembered? Could have said, what have you forgotten? There's only two words. What have you remembered? She goes, I've remembered my swimming kit. I've remembered my book. I've remembered my pee. I go, that's fantastic. You have such a great memory that when you get to the gate, you remember, and back you come. And very quickly, she didn't have to come back because I never said, what have you forgotten today? Oh my God, your mind is like a sieve. What's wrong with you? You get to the gate. And I never do that. And you forget, why can't you be like me? I have my little bag by the door. I put everything the night before. And I never did that. I said, what have you remembered? So here's just one word. And my clients really taught me the power of words. Because I'd see the ones who'd come and go, I wish I could do that. 
oh, thanks, Marissa, for all this stuff. I could do that, but. I know I ought to do that, and I should, but. And so I started banning words. I said, when you come in this office, you're not allowed to go wish, but hope. I work a lot with infertile women, and the ones who don't get pregnant always say that, I, I wish I could get pregnant. And then when they get pregnant, they say, I'm so scared of losing it. I'm not gonna tell anyone just in case I lose it. I'm like, well, but what are you saying to your baby? It's in the womb, the most developed sense is hearing. I'm not even gonna tell anyone you're here because I have no faith you're going to make it. I go, how about sending the scans out to your parents and showing them, this is my baby, it's staying, my body made it, my body is so super smart. My body is gonna carry this baby to full term. This is my one chance in the world to be God. I'm making a miracle here. And my body is growing that baby physically, and I'm growing and nurturing that baby emotionally and every day I tell it, today your spine is forming. This week your mouth and lips are forming and your ears are forming and it sends a message to the brain that goes, this is working, whereas running to the bathroom every hour to just see if you're spotting, saying, oh, I'm really scared of losing it, sends a message to the mind and one of the rules of the mind and it's the best rule is that Every thought you think and every word you say forms a blueprint and your mind must work to make that blueprint real. So when you say, I can't remember anything, I'd lose the eyes in the back of my head if they weren't fixed in there because I just can't remember anything, your mind goes, that's a blueprint, let me take you to it. And when you say, my memory is phenomenal, foolproof. In fact, I'm like human Google. When I read an exam, the minute I read the question, my mind has already gone to work, found the answer, and I, it stays in my head right through until I write it on the paper. Then I read the next question, the same thing happens. As I read the question, Google says, here's the answer. I work with children all the time with exam stress, and they come in. I was a little boy last year who had, um, I think there were 17 children applied for every place in his school, and he flunked the mocks. And I'm like, darling, you're supposed to flunk the mocks. It's great to flunk the mocks. You know what mocks are, don't you? Oh, so in England, when you're taking an exam, you have a mock exam, maybe six weeks before you take the exam, just to see how you do. And then they say, well, you did terribly, you did really well, and because you did really well, you're gonna pass that exam, and because you did terribly, you're gonna fail. In fact, the ones who do well in the mocks get so complacent they often don't do so well in the actual exam. And the ones who do badly think, wow, I need to up my game. I need to revise more and study more. So when he came in and said, my mummy was so upset because I got really bad marks in the marks. I went, that's fantastic. What were you worse on? He said, the, 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 the writing, what did you do? So I didn't read the instructions correctly and I didn't use the right words. I went, that's fantastic. In fact, what I'll do is, his name is Isaac. If on my website, marissapeer.com, I will put that um, video up and you can watch me working with a small child using language. Just go to marissapeer.com. We'll put that up in a couple of days. And so I said, that's fantastic. So what did you need to do? And just by changing his language, I didn't use the right words and explained to him that he could do it and telling him that his mind was like Google. Then I was asking him some questions about Harry Potter. And I said, how do you know these answers? Have you studied Harry Potter? He went, no. I just really like it. I said, well, see how clever your mind is. So when you're working with a kid that says, I don't know, ask them about James Bond. Ask them about something that they like and go, how do you know this? They go, I don't know. How do you know? Wow, you're so smart. Because when they like something, they remember. And part of school is liking something. So with this little kid, he got into that school. I knew he'd get in because he came in like that and he left like that. He was like, I'm going to nail this. I know what to do. My mind is like Google. And I will say to all my clients, whether they're a seven-year-old taking an exam or someone taking a medical exam or the bar, I say, what? 
whatever you're reading, your focus narrows down. You say the word narrow down, and when you say narrow down, everything fades away. You're absorbed in that paper. You have phenomenal powers of concentration, comprehension, recall, retention, and assimilation. And I, I say words that help you do the next one. Comprehension, comprehension, retention, recall, assimilation. I say it over and over again because the mind believes what you tell it. So let's go through the rules of the mind. Here is the first one. Expected tends to be realized. When you say to a child, I don't know what's wrong with you. Your brother was in my class last year and he was so good. Why can't you learn? Why can't you sit still? Why are you so disruptive? What is wrong with you? You're making words that form a child's blueprint. And exactly the same for adults. I'm referring this a lot to children, but for the therapist here, those children come in as your clients. But it's just the same for adults. If, if your boss says to you, can you do this? And you go, oh my God, I'm going to have to race through it and I'm going to have to rush it. I haven't got enough time to prepare. I know I'm going to get it wrong. I'm going to go on stage, open my mouth and go, oh, 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 and look like a complete retard. Well, when you say that, it tends to be realized. And here's one of my favorite rules of the mind. The mind responds to words that make a picture. So in America, they were giving these kids pencils called don't do drugs. And as they sharpened them, the word don't disappeared. And they said, do drugs. Not very smart. You need to put that the other way around. What is expected tends to be realized. When a child is doing something like climbing a tree and the mother goes, you're going to fall. You're going to break your leg. Oh my God, you're going to break your ankle. You can make that happen. And when you say to the child now, I know you're climbing the tree. Look where you're putting your hands. Look where you're going to place your feet. Focus on what you're doing. That will be realized. So in powerful language, you can never say you're going to fall. You're going to mess that up. You're going to ruin everything. That's just not going to work out. You have to say the opposite. Okay. I've only got 10 minutes to prepare my speech. I only need 10 minutes. I've only got 10 minutes to get there. That's exactly how much time I need. And if I'm late, I wasn't supposed to be there on time. I have a belief now when I get to a party late, it's because it wasn't, I wasn't meant to get there early. I no longer go, oh my God, I'm so late. This is going to be terrible. In fact, I was recently going in a cab across town to get a train to work with a football team. And we got stuck in traffic. And so I was playing a game. I thought, oh my God, I'm going to miss the train. This is terrible. I'm going to ruin my reputation. The team are going to be so upset. And I felt really sick. And then I started to say, the trains run every 20 minutes. It doesn't matter what's 20 minutes. My material is so great. They have lots of time. After all, they finished um, practicing at 3 o'clock. And, and it was fine. So all the way there, I was playing a game and I actually got the train on time, but they really wouldn't have minded. But I could have ruined my day, made myself panicky and sweaty by going, oh my God, I haven't got enough time and now it's all ruined. And it's never ruined. You can come back from anything. And then I worked with a client who had cancer and had to go into this MRI scanner. And every time I saw him, he said, I can't, I can't do it. I can't get in that scanner. And I wonder, he said, well, I feel like I'm in my coffin. I feel like it's a premonition of my death. And when I get in the scanner, I think, well, I've got cancer and I'm going to die. And he said, well, I freak out. I press the button. I have to come out. And they keep saying, look, you've got to. I can't. I can't even be in there for two seconds, which is not true. And say, I, can, I can't do it for even a second. He probably was in there for a few minutes. I said, look, the words you say to yourself in that scanner, this is a premonition of my death. I feel like I'm in a coffin, I feel like I'm suffocating and I can't do it, that's a blueprint. And your mind doesn't like those words. So how about these words? How about saying, I'm in my bed at home and I'm just so chilled and I could lie here for hours. I'm chilled, I'm relaxed, I'm blissed out. You must use words that make a picture. You can't go, oh, I'm okay really. I'm quite good, I'm not bad, this is okay. Because when I say the words, okay, not bad, what's the picture? There's no picture, it's what I call fluff. 
When you say, I'm chilled, I'm blissed out, I'm ecstatic, I'm just lying here and I could do this for hours, it's just so cool, the mind goes, you're right. And when you go, I'm in a coffin and I'm suffocating, the mind goes, you're right. See, here's the great thing. You can choose any words you like. You can go, well, we're all going to be negative, and this half's going to be positive. That's your choice. You know what you can't choose? What you do to yourself when you say, I'm an idiot, I'm a moron, I'm a retard, I've got rocks for brains, everything goes wrong. Who would ever like me? I've got cellular, I'm a single parent, I've got no chance blah, 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 I didn't go to college, so I couldn't possibly do what you do. I got kicked out of college, by the way, so you can definitely do what I do. And it was the best thing that ever happened to me. I can look at my life and say being fired, being dumped, and being kicked out of college. Thank you, God, for putting that in, up to me because it changed my life. It was the best thing. Rejection has been one of the best things that ever happened to me. Being the least favorite kid, if I could have my life again, I'd go back and be the least favorite kid because I thought I'm going to show my parents that I'm something. And if I was the favorite, I wouldn't have done that. I would have had a totally different life. So with my client, I was saying, you know, these words are really important. So he got in the scanner, he stayed there for hours, and he said that when he came out, all the nurses and doctors came in and gave him a standing ovation. He said it was more powerful than his last business deal because he felt so good. Some years later, I had to go in a scanner. I thought, well, I'm just going to play with this. I love playing with words. So I lay there, and I was going, I'm so chilled. This is so good. How many of us said, I'd love 20 minutes to myself? Well, here I am. 20 minutes to myself. I can lie here and do nothing. No one's going, can you proof this copy? Can you answer this email? Can you speak to this client? My daughter's going, mommy, my boiler's broken in my apartment. Can you come over right now and fix it? I had 20 minutes to myself. And I was going, I'm so chilled. And then I thought, let's do the opposite. So I was like, I, I, I'm in a coffin. I've got claustrophobia. I feel like I'm trapped. And all the buzzers went off, and I didn't even know I was moving. And then they speak to her, and I said, Marissa, you have to lie completely still. Stop moving. So I had to go back into, I'm chilled, I'm ecstatic, I'm blissed out. And I love doing that. And it's a really good thing to do to yourself. I'm late, I've ruined everything. I have all the time I need. You see, you have a choice. Every day you get to choose how to speak to yourself. But you know what you don't get to choose? What you do to your body when you say, I'm an idiot. I knew I'd mess that up. I knew that relationship wouldn't work. I've been waiting for it to go wrong. In fact, the day we got married, I stuck stickers on all my stuff so that when we got divorced, there'd be no confusion. <laughs> I was already planning the miscarriage. I didn't buy anything for my baby. I mean, who does that? Lots of people, apparently. They're all my clients, and they plan for stuff to go wrong. They say, I sent my kid to college, and I said, don't worry, you're probably going to hate it. Here's a credit card so you can get a return ticket back in a week's time. They plan it, and you don't want to plan it. You want to ban it. So words are really powerful. You can choose to be negative or positive. That's your choice, but you cannot choose what you do to yourself when you use negative language. So the first rule of the mind, what you expect is realized. Who thinks that's true? So here's my advice to you, expect amazing things then. If what is expected tends to be realized, expect the best. Expect love and success and an amazing life because you know what? It will probably be realized really fast if you expect it. Imagination is more powerful than knowledge when dealing with your own mind and the mind of others. If I said to any of you, come and stand on this chair, who would come and stand on this chair? I'll give you $100 to stand on this chair. Sure, if I said, well, now the chair is, that, is on top of that spire on the highest building in Tallinn, who's going to climb up and stand on it for $100? Who would do that? Some people would, because they've got a good imagination. They go, if I can stand on it there, I can stand. And most people go, no, I could fall. If you've got a little tiny plank up here, you can walk the plank when it's on the floor. Put the plank between two high-rise buildings. Who's going to walk it? Not many people, because the imagination that you could fall 
and kill yourself is way more powerful than the knowledge that I did this on the ground. It's wide enough. Fear of flying. Knowledge says it's actually the safest place in the world. The most dangerous part of a flight is actually the drive to the airport. That's way more dangerous than being in the plane. Do you think the imagination cares? We'll go, I'm in a flying coffin. I'm hurtling through the air. And that guy looks like he's come straight out of ISIS. And he's in the bar. I think he's going to blow up the plane. And then you feel terrible. The other person's going, I'm watching a movie. I've always wanted to watch The Shape of Water. This is so great. Here's my time again to do nothing. So whatever you imagine will defeat logic, will defeat knowledge. And when dealing with children, people do logical. Stuff. Why are you so bad? Why can't you get it? What's going on? Why are you so naughty? And that doesn't work. I never say to kids, why are you bad? I go, what happened to you? I was working with a little kid recently who always played up before lunch and would get hysterical after every meal. And I'd actually been in an orphanage in Zimbabwe, and I'd seen that a lot, that at the end of the meals, the kids start weeping uncontrollably because they don't know when the next meal is coming. And they go, look, you're in an orphanage. It's fine. We have food. You'll be fed three times a day. It takes about two years for those children to stop crying as they remove the plates because the emotion is, when's the next meal coming? So this little boy was really difficult at school, and he'd been to three different schools. And one of the teachers contacted me, and I said, when does he do it? She said, well, he always does it before meals. And I said, you should ask him not why he does it, but what happened to him. And then the mother came in and said, well, well I adopted him at one. He was born to crackheads. And he cr used to cry when I left the room. And when I read his notes, his parents would leave the room for three days. And he didn't get fed very much. And so he's got this panic about not being fed. And I said, well, you should tell the school that. And of course, you can't logically say to a child, look, you're going to be fed every four hours. You have to go, look, you have some memories. They're really sad, but mommy is going to put some nuts in your bag. And you're always going to have something. And you can't do it logically because feeling is more powerful than logic. The feeling you're going to die on a plane will always wipe out the logic that this is the safest way to travel. One of my clients said, please help me. So I've done the logic. I went to British Airways flying course. I walked into the cockpit wearing shorts and I lost control of my bowels in front of everyone. Now I'm even more scared about flying because this was a course to make you better. They were logically showing me all the controls. When they said they were taking off, I had a terrible accident. I knew it was bad because the pilot put a mask on and I had to be taken off that plane. And now I'm even further back from ever flying because logic doesn't work. Emotion does. And so I would talk to her and say, you know, you have to pretend you're at the front. You have to say when you're on the plane, I love it. Oh, my God, flying thrills me. It elates me. It empowers me. It delights me. I love flying. Your mind goes, you're right. And when you go, I'm going to be blown out of the sky, it's a smithereens, your mind goes, you're right. Because here's another rule of the mind. It does not care if what you do is right or wrong, good or bad true or false, healthy or unhealthy, it just lets it in. So let me show you. Put your hand in front of your mouth. You may have done this before, but let's do it again. Put your hand in front of your mouth like you're about to eat. Close your eyes. And imagine you have a big, fat, juicy, gorgeous lemon in your hand. I want you to breathe in that gorgeous, gorgeous lemon smell. I want you to squish that lemon and feel the waxy surface. Open your mouth, still with your eyes closed. Shove that lemon in your mouth and eat it. I want you to bite the flesh of that lemon. Suck out the flesh. Suck out the lemon. Start chewing it, eating it. Eat that whole entire half of a lemon. Keep going, keep sucking, chewing and swallowing. And open your eyes. And put your hand up if you made saliva. So here's a question for you. Where was the lemon? Where was it? Say that again. Yeah, people say there wasn't one. Oh, there was. There definitely was a lemon. It was in your imagination. You know there's no lemon. You go, what's going on here? I know there's no lemon. Why am I pumping out saliva and going like that? What am I doing that for? I know it's not there. But your mind believes it. 
The mind will believe everything you tell it. Tell it great things. Don't use wishy-washy, I hope, I try, maybe, who knows. You know, I took, I had a partner years ago who was very ill, and I took him to see a doctor, and the doctor got out the notes and went, hmm, I'll try to make you better. I do the very best. I said, this is not the doctor for you. He's like, look, this is my illness. I'm like, I know, but I'm a therapist. We, we have to interfere. It's our job. It's our calling. So you cannot go to an oncologist that says, I will try, and I hope this works, and if it doesn't, we'll try something else, because it's filling your mind up with nothing. So I'm very lucky. I'm in the book in London for the best doctors in England. I'm not a doctor, I'm a therapist, but they very nicely put me in there. Very happy about that, because I can speak to all the other doctors. So I said to some doctors, who is the best one? They went, Roger Kirby, without, without a second's hesitation. So I called Kirby and said, look, we're in the same book. I have this friend with cancer. He said, oh, that's my area of excellence. Bring him in. I brought him in. And when he said to him what he had, he went, well, I happen to be the best oncologist in Europe for your problem, and I will fix it, you will be fine, you'll still be here when you're 75. Which one do you think he liked? And he did say, well, I've already got someone. He went, who is he? He went, oh, I trained him, he's not as good as me. He went, right, I'm going to the teacher, not the student. Because the words, I am the best, I know what to do, you're in good hands, I will save you. I will cure you. We're allowed to say that in the UK. I will make you better. A very different to, well, I'll try. We have this new drug. It could work. If it doesn't, there's something else. We can only hope. I mean, that puts film. We can only hope. Let's try. Don't do that. We this is amazing. This is awesome. This is phenomenal. I use the same words all the time when I'm teaching my students, my RTT grads, what I do. You are elated, you're empowered, you are thrilled, you're delighted. This is awesome, this is amazing. When I make clients and they go, I love the words. Where did you get those words? I'm like, well, I find the most negative ones and I flip them over. I'm useless, I'm spectacular, I'm terrified, I'm delighted. And by the way, fear and, and excitement are exactly the same. You can be on a fun fair screaming your head off and going, Oh, look at that. Are they scared or excited? I don't know. Do you? Because it's the same. When you're excited, you scream. And when you're scared, you scream. So whatever you're doing, say, I'm excited. And you'll feel excited or go, I'm terrified. And you'll feel terrified. We've done in the battle between emotion and logic. Emotion always wins. Your mind does what it thinks you want it to do. This is probably one of the most powerful rules of the mind. Here's your mind's job. It's got a very clear job. I'm your mind and I'm going to do what I think you want. And when you say, oh, this commute is killing me. My boss makes me want to die. My kids are making me go up the wall. I am stressed out of my mind by the freeway. Your mind goes, oh, you keep telling me that something is killing you. It appears to be your job or your commute. Why don't I just give you a lovely ulcer and then you can stay home and avoid that place that's killing you? It's, that's its job. Why don't you do your job and talk to your mind better? The commute is a pain, but I have great CDs to listen to. I have stuff to do. My boss is difficult with everyone. It's not me. He's not there and I'm having sex with my wife. He's not in the room and we're having a lovely dinner. This is temporary. He's an unhappy person. Do it better. You will get what you want when you tell your mind what you want. But here come the words. Let's imagine you're going to give a speech. And the words are, oh my God, I'm freaked out. I'm terrified. I I'm going to go bright red out my mouth and go, oh. I, I haven't got the time right. I, I, I'm so nervous. Your mind goes, do not get on that stage. If you walk to that stage, I'm going to give you a massive panic in the middle of the room because you told me you don't want to do it and I've got to do what you want. Or you can go, I am fantastic at speaking. I've got something to say. People like me. What I have to say is a value. Speaking to a stage is like speaking to my wife or husband. And then your mind goes, get on that stage and do it. You always have a choice, but your mind's job is to do what it thinks you want. When you go, I want a week off. Who's ever done this? 
what I would give for a week off lying in bed. Your mind goes, leave that with me. Now you got the flu. How cool am I? I listened to you. You wanted a week off lying around watching Netflix. Now you got it. That's not what you wanted. You need to say, I need some time, and I'm like a battery, I need to recharge, and I'm okay at working full out all week, because at weekends, I recharge like a battery. Now your mind understands, but saying, I'd give anything not to have to chair that meeting, your mind goes, how about a nice dose of diarrhea? I can bring that up for you. You don't want to chair that meeting? You said I'd do anything not to go. I'd rather kill myself than give that presentation to my boss. And I goes, oh, don't kill yourself. I just give you a really upset stomach. Now you can't even leave the bathroom. There's no chance you're meeting your boss. You've done what you wanted. I know I'm making it funny, but it is funny that so many people don't understand your mind's job is to do what it thinks you want, and it bases that on one thing, the words you use and the pictures you put in your head. And here's some great news. You can change those words and change those pictures like that. And when you do that, it changes everything.